This is the news leader, ABC 7 Eyewitness News. After a possible West Nile death, a new round of spraying is just hours away on Long Island. And after years of training, a girl's dreams to play high school football are dashed after she's ordered to take a test that none of the other players had to take. Good evening, everyone. I'm Sandra Bookman in for Roz Abrams. I'm Rob Hanrahan. Glad you're with us. West Nile worries are prompting a fresh round of mosquito spraying on Long Island tonight. An elderly Suffolk County man died over the weekend from West Nile-like symptoms. And while officials are awaiting definitive word on the cause of death, they are not waiting to go after the, the insects that spread that disease. Let's go to Long Island reporter Lauren DeFranco in Babylon now with more for us. Lauren. Well, Rob, aerial spraying of Scourge is supposed to start at 7 o'clock tonight here in Babylon. And health officials tell us they will be targeting areas like this. This is prime breeding ground for mosquitoes. They made the decision to spray after the death of an 81-year-old man from Melville. If confirmed, this would be the first West Nile-related fatality in the state. I'm going to bring my small children in the house. We're going to shut the windows, uh, make sure my air condition is turned off. And, uh, George Martucci of Babylon is reluctantly getting ready for round one in the fight against mosquitoes carrying the West Nile virus. Aerial spraying starts tonight. Are you worried about her? Of course I'm worried about her. Spraying or no spraying. But we're going to uh, do what's necessary. County health officials made the decision to spray after finding evidence of the virus in dead birds and infected mosquito pools and they're investigating three suspected human cases. Earlier this month, an 81-year-old man from Melville died from what is believed to be West Nile. Also, a 77-year-old woman from Babylon is currently ill with the flu-like symptoms. And a 55-year-old man from East Setauket is now fully recovered. It's a very targeted uh, spray operation. It, uh, it dissipates very rapidly in the environment. Um, in, in roughly approximately an hour, an hour and a half to two hours. Um, it has very, very uh, few, if any, uh, uh, serious adverse consequences to people. Headaches, nausea, incoordination, tremors, convulsions. These are serious issues. These are issues that should not be taken lightly. Adrian Esposito heads up a citizen's campaign for the environment and points to documented reports that show the detrimental health effects of scourge and other pesticides. They should do a very limited, targeted ground spraying where they have found infected mosquito pools and not do the aerial spraying, which exposes the vast majority of the public to toxic pesticides. Spraying on Long Island will begin tonight from 7 to 11 p.m. in Babylon, West Babylon, North Babylon, West Islip, and West Bayshore. And again tomorrow night in Melville, South Huntington, Huntington Manor, and Huntington Station. And tonight... Spraying also begins in Queens from 8.30 p.m. to 2 a.m. in Rosedale and Brookville. Spraying will also take place tomorrow on Staten Island from 8.30 p.m. to 2 a.m. in Oakwood Beach, New Dorp Beach, Silver Lake Park and Golf Course, and all areas west of Huguenot Avenue. And if you do live in one of those areas, take the necessary precautions, stay inside, and turn off your air conditioning. Reporting live from Babylon, Long Island, Lauren DeFranco, ABC7. Eyewitness News. Thank you, Lauren. Police delivering a search warrant in Harlem make an explosive discovery. Officers recovered several smoke grenades, rifles, and ammunition from an apartment. Now two people are under arrest. Marcus Solis is live in Harlem with the latest. Marcus? Well, Sandra, things have calmed down, but at one point, emergency service, bomb squad, fire department units all converging here on 100. 27th Street in Harlem. Just before 11 this morning, police were executing that search warrant in the apartment of someone they arrested last week, and that's when they discovered that large cache of weapons. Now, perhaps the most dangerous item seized was a rocket-propelled grenade. Uh, however, the bomb squad determined that that weapon was inert. But they say they found plenty of live ammunition as well. Much of it was in metal cases that they brought out to be cataloged later. Now, the apartment is that of 57-year-old David White, a former maintenance man who now lives in the St. Nicholas houses. He was arrested on the 18th of August after allegedly threatening three youths with a shotgun. A search warrant was obtained, and that led to today's discovery. There's also some smoke grenades, uh, some black powder, uh, a number of uh, rifles and long guns, uh, a couple of uh, pellet guns. Uh, we believe at least one black powder gun. Uh, and a large uh, uh, number of uh, military-type paraphernalia.
Now, White's companion, Janice Labrie, who was also arrested. The original charges against Mr. White were criminal possession of a weapon and reckless endangerment. Additional charges are pending, as are the charges against Ms. Labrie. And we're live in Harlem. Marcus Solis, ABC 7 Eyewitness News. Marcus, thank you. The search is on for the man who stabbed three people, killing one of them in, on a subway. The police say four men in their 20s got into an argument on an A train at the Broadway Junction station early yesterday. One man suddenly pulled a knife, stabbed the other three, and fled. One of those men died. He was dead on arrival at Kings County Hospital. The other two at this hour are in stable condition. In Brooklyn, some people are taking aim at what they call stealth shelters. They're buildings that were originally designed as condos and lofts, but which quietly were reclassified to become housing for the homeless. Could the same thing be happening in your neighborhood? N.J. Burkett looks at the controversy. The building permit in the window calls for the construction of artist loft. But it's a cruel twist for residents who have struggled to stabilize Prospect Heights because the real tenants will be homeless people. Muriel Tillingast lives around the corner. Probably we estimate about 400 people here. Okay, so I'd say anywhere, I'm lowballing it from 200 to 400 people in this facility, turning around every 10 to 20 days. That's too much for them, and it's really too much for us. Once it is completed, 768 Pacific Street is expected to become a transitional home for nearly 100 homeless families, where each month, the entire population will turn over. It's not as if these people are going to become part of this community. Because it will be operated by a private company under contract with the city, there were never public hearings, and the permit was allowed to be amended. It all comes as the city struggles with a surging homeless population and a court order that forces city officials to provide shelter. Neighbors were furious when homeless began showing up at a motel in Queens last week and in Brooklyn when workers began carrying bunk beds into this building in Fort Greene, originally slated, say the neighbors, to be luxury condos. We sort of feel that we really already have picked up our fair share and that it's time for some of the other neighboring communities to maybe pick up the slack a bit. When I moved here, we had terrible problems with guns, gun running, drugs. Right. We worked long and hard to get on top of that. We have to live with what happens here. Neighbors here in Prospect Heights insist they already have more than their share of halfway houses and homeless shelters. They say their only hope of stopping the project now is this lawsuit. In the Prospect Heights section of Brooklyn, N.J. Burke at ABC7 Eyewitness News. In an Eyewitness News Survey USA polled residents throughout the five boroughs on the issue of homeless shelters. Here's what we found out. 71 of those polled, say 71%, I should say, say the city should build more homeless shelters. 20% disagree. But they're almost evenly split when it comes to where the shelters should be built. 50% say they would not feel comfortable having a homeless shelter in their neighborhood, but 43% say they would feel comfortable. The poll's margin of error is plus or minus 4.5%. We are, of course, in the middle of rush hour. We're going to check in with Newscopter 7 already over some trouble spots. I believe you're high over Demarest, New Jersey. Is that right? That is correct. Demarest, New Jersey is the location. Knickerbocker Road, to be a little more precise. This accident happened just in front of a high school about a half hour ago. It involved this truck going into a pole and it took down some wires. Now we do have six serious injuries reported. You can see EMS is on the scene taking away the injured on stretchers. Uh, mutual aid ambulances are here to assist and we'll have more on this story as it develops. And we're live over Bergen County, Andrew Torres, ABC7 Eyewitness News. Thank you, Andrew. As Oregon authorities continue to search the home and property where two bodies were found over the weekend, we are learning more about the man who has become the prime suspect in what is now a double murder case. ABC's Carla Wool is live in Oregon with Oregon City with more. Carla? Sandra, more about that suspect in a moment, but first a look at the memorial to the girls. It continues to grow on the fence surrounding the suspect's home. Meanwhile, inside that fence, authorities are digging up the ground looking for clues. Armed with backhoes and special ground-penetrating radar, detectives continue to search this Oregon City property for evidence in the murders of two young girls. Hopefully we will finish the grounds today. The remains of 13-year-old Miranda Gaddis were found Saturday in a shed behind the house. Another set of human remains were found buried under this concrete slab. They are still awaiting identification, but they are believed to be those of 13-year-old Ashley Pond. Ashley's stepmother says she is not surprised by the gruesome discovery. In fact, she had placed this sign over the slab. 
I don't know how I knew, I just knew. I, I felt something there, very strong. Ashley disappeared last January on her way from her home to the bus stop. Her friend Miranda was interviewed on local TV. It's really hard to believe that having a one of your friends or something. Then in March, she too disappeared. Authorities now confirm what their neighbor, 39-year-old Ward Weaver, has proclaimed for some time. Yeah, I mean, they are looking at me, and I have no problem with them looking at me as a suspect. Weaver knew both girls and is now in jail on charges he raped his son's girlfriend. In fact, it was his son who called 911, saying Weaver had killed Ashley and Miranda. The murders have traumatized this low-income community just south of Portland. The fence surrounding Weaver's property now testament to the town's grief. I'm really sorry, and, and I wish that this never happened, and I wish it was all a dream. Weaver has yet to be charged with the murders, and there are several questions that remain unanswered. Chief among them, how did he allegedly kill the girls and why? Reporting live in Oregon City, I'm Carla Wool, ABC News. Back to you, Rob. Thank you, Carla. The FBI's criminal investigation into the anthrax attacks as agents returning to a deadly contamination site in Florida. Starting Wednesday, agents will again comb the American Media Building in Boca Raton. That's the office of the National Enquirer and Star tabloids. An employee died from anthrax there last fall. Officials say new techniques will help agents collect and analyze spores. They stress the public faces no new, da new danger. In no way, shape, or form is their safety in jeopardy, their health, or anything of that nature simply because the reentry is occurring. That will be done proficiently, professionally, and with any, without any further, uh, perhaps, concern for the public. Well, the building has been under quarantine since October when that employee died. The investigation is expected to take two weeks. Meantime, there's no sign of any anthrax spores in three postal facilities in New Jersey. Testing at the Hamilton, West Windsor, and South River facilities last week have turned up negative. The tests were conducted as a precaution after spores were found in a Princeton mailbox two weeks ago. It's been 10 months since at least four anthrax-laced letters passed through the Hamilton mail facility, which remains closed. They are serving up tight security on this opening day of the U.S. Open tennis tournament. More than half a million spectators are expected to attend the two-week event, and every one of them will be subject to intense scrutiny. Every bag, every vehicle entering the grounds is being searched. Video cameras and com computers rather, are among the many items that are banned. Bomb-sniffing dogs and a heavy police presence are, of course, sobering reminders of just how much the world has changed since September 11th. Lieutenant Governor candidate Dennis Meal says he thinks voters will not turn against him following his admission that he fathered two children out of wedlock. Meal and his running mate Carl McCall appeared at a state fair in Syracuse today. Yesterday he dropped a bombshell that he fathered two children with two different women following his separation from his first wife but before he was legally divorced. Coming up at 6 o'clock on Eyewitness News, we'll hear from Meal and have reaction from Carl McCall. Well, coming up later on Eyewitness News, the Harlem Heroes are home. Fans, welcome back the All-Star Little Leaguers. 14-year-old says she was kicked off the high school football team because she's a girl. I'm Cheryl Yandaka. I'll have that story coming up. Hi there, I'm Rebecca Rankin. Coming up, a story in the latest trends in jeans, including these ones with a little padding in the behind. And this man has nothing on Jacques Cousteau, but he is trying the story and much more when Eyewitness News continues. Hi, I'm Wayne Brady. Could I have a word with you? How about talk? Oh, talk is a good word to describe my new daytime show. <laughs> Whoa, but it's also entertaining with music. Oh, and uh, laughs. <laughs> Plus, we'll have celebrities, love your work, and everyday people. Okay, that's two words. So come on, hang out at the new Wayne Brady Show. Man, it's gonna be, <laughs> well, you know. Catch Wayne Brady starting September 2nd at 10 a.m. right here on ABC7. Tomorrow night when the series this morning, baseball players are ready to take their ball and go home, counting down to that possible strike. And I'm meteorologist Lee Goldberg. The last week of August looking a lot stormier than the first three. My forecast in the morning. Watch out when the series this morning, tomorrow morning, beginning at 5 a.m. After training for six years, a Staten Island girl is seeing her dreams of playing high school football disappear. 
and a decade-old state rule may be to blame. Cheryl Fiondaka is in St. George with the story for us tonight. Cheryl. Well, Rob, Damaris Roy started as a cheerleader, but quickly decided she'd rather play the game than cheer for the players. And she did for several years, until last week when school officials here on Staten Island told her because she's a girl, she would have to pass a state fitness test to play with the boys. Roy says it was just a way to keep her off the team. I was eight years old when I started playing. Football, that is. Damaris Roig was a linebacker in the Pee Wee League and played with the boys for six years. Until this year, when Curtis High School refused to let her on the team. Because I'm a girl, and they just probably just don't want a girl on the team. Roig won several trophies and was last year's MVP, playing for the Jaguars in Pee Wee football. She was a good player. I gave her the Sportsman of the Year award. You know, that's like the best player on the field. She played offensive guard for me and defensive tackle. She had about five and a half sacks. And she pulled, you know, she knew how to pull, she knew how to down block. You know, she kicked out when she had to. She was a very good player for me. At first, Curtis High School on Staten Island, where Roy will be a freshman this year, accepted the 14-year-old on the team and even charged her $365 for football camp. <laughs> told us to bring sheets. But Roy says a few days before football camp started, she was forced to take a state fitness test because she was a girl. None of the boys were required to take the test. Roy and her mother say they weren't told anything other than she failed. Just started crying because how was I going to explain that to her, that she had all her things ready? She was ready to go. We were just getting ready to get up to take her to camp. School officials say they're bound by State Department regulations. Roy, though, is not giving up. If you put me in the team, the team and you give me a chance, I'm going to show you. They'll be like, you want me in the team every year, Harley. Well, the Board of Ed says the rule works both ways. If a boy wanted to play on a girls' team, he would have to pass a fitness test. As for Roy, she can appeal the test and retake it. Her mother is looking for a lawyer and a new school that will allow her to play football. In St. George on Staten Island, I'm Cheryl Fiandaka, ABC7 Eyewitness News. All right, Cheryl, thank you very much. A slightly different kind of sports story in New Jersey this evening, where losing your cool could get you booted all of the bleachers. Now, there's a new law that allows school boards and sports organizations to create athletic codes of conduct for parents, coaches, and students. Now, those who break the rules could be banned from games until they receive anger management counseling. The measure was prompted by recent incidents at sporting events. Coming up next on Eyewitness News, Thomas Galasano's run for governor caused some financial problems for staffers. Why their paychecks were late? That's next in 7 on Your Side. A new laser used for ultrasound may provide treatment for prostate cancer. And we'll take you to an egg cream extravaganza in Brooklyn. That's ahead in the one and only Which Eyewitness News Reel. You could not have helped but notice this weekend the pattern, the weather pattern has changed. So what's ahead for the week? Well, your forecast is on its way. Next at 6, the McCall campaign on the hot seat. Eyewitness News on a stunning admission and what voters say. Plus, without this, your kids couldn't go to school. Now, a change. Eyewitness News sets the record straight on vaccinations. Next at 6 on Eyewitness News. That was great. We have a little surprise for you. Oh, my God. You are a mother. That is the biggest difference you can make. That is a reason to do television. Two of the biggest superstars of our time. I'm so excited. Monday, September 16th. All new shows. America, America! A brand new season of Oprah. Okay. Weekdays at 4 on ABC7. Have you seen Jalil? ABC7 and your local tri state Ford stores urge you to protect our children. Waterworld takes on a whole new meaning for this man. Chris Angel submerged himself during Good Morning America. Uh, the tank is actually located in front of the WWE restaurant in Times Square. Angel was lowered into a tank, and he will stay there until 8.30 tomorrow morning. Now, you can see he's upside down, mm -hmm. and apparently they're going to cut off the air supply after 24 hours, and he gets out of the shackles and gets himself out. Okay. After a 24-hour soaking, Sam. Want to try that? No. No. <laughs> Neither do I. My, my biggest question is why? <laughs> I just, why, do, why do that on a beautiful day like today, right? I want to know why. Yeah. I don't know. Well, you know, as long as he's having fun and everybody's having a good time and play safe. Uh, we'll walk out. <laughs>
<laughs> outside our doors and show you. Exa don't do that at home in the tub. It's just, no, not a good thing. Uh, Newscopter 7 is over the Hudson. Actually, they're somewhere near the George looking south. And our skies have actually been fairly nice today. We kind of pulled it out on Sunday after the cloudy Saturday. But if you were with us on Friday, you knew exactly what to expect out of the weekend. And now the trend is to keep some cool clouds in for a good part of this week. And we'll talk about several opportunities to pick up some showers as we go through the week. And hopefully it'll brighten up by the end of the week. But right now, 82 degrees outside right now. Relative humidity at 37 percent. The barometer fry falling at this point. Where frying came from, I don't know. It's dangerous in the head. West winds at about six miles per hour, 82 degrees, the mildest number on this day. We'll show you what it looks like. Maybe I've been soaking upside down. 80 degrees would be normal this time of year. Sunrise and sunset there for you on that one page. 75 degrees toward the island. Western numbers about the same thing. Northern lines at 75 to 77. Southern numbers warming up 82 to 83 and holding it right now. For plans in the U.S. Open overnight for the big uh, festivities, uh, 75 degrees is about the coolest temperature when you would be at the park. 80 degrees tomorrow with a mixture of sun and clouds for the games that are slated there. There's an awful lot of cloudiness throughout the southeast. The idea there is they've also been in a drought for about two or three years now. So some much needed small systems bringing some much needed rainfall all the way through the southeast. And the thing is, some of this is going to start working its way north as we go through the week. A weak front is going to kind of stall right on top of us overnight tonight. That's going to keep some clouds in the way. And then all of this moisture gets the opportunity to build up from the southeast and we'll get several clips of some clouds and maybe even some quick showers that could move in as early as Wednesday. When we show you the five day in the next half hour, we're really moving in on Thursday, but we could have it in as early as Wednesday afternoon, getting some good soaking showers through here. But the idea here, some clouds, partly cloudy tonight, 68 degrees. And for the day tomorrow, clouds and sunshine, 80 degrees is the temperature. It's not a bad looking day out there tomorrow at all. I favor clouds here, but there's a mix out there. You'll notice the sun breaking through the clouds during the day. Then tomorrow night, cloudy skies, 66 degrees. That sets up our plan for the five day and ooh, a little tease there, ooh, but it's a really little, just a little ooh, just a glimpse, but it comes in the next half hour. And that is kind of a cool and cloudy. I day. saw some sevens on that board. So we'll have to look numbers, for that. True. All right. You tease you. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Thanks, Sam. Thank you, Sam. Well, it was supposed to be a grassroots effort to get a candidate on the ballot. But some workers were wondering what went wrong when they didn't get paid. That's when they called for Taffy Phillips and Seven on their side. Well, this is a recipe for political irony. On the one hand, there's billionaire politician Tom Golisano, whose payroll company Paychex made him millions. On the other hand, a number of campaign workers hired to help get his name on the ballot. The problem? A small number of workers say they didn't get paid, and that's when they cast their vote for help from seven on their side. Emmanuel Colazzo is putting himself through school. That's why this incoming college freshman desperately needs cash. Pay bills, survive, eat, transportation, look for more work, go to school, I'm in college, pay books, a lot of things. So the 20-year-old took a job for a company called National Voter Outreach. NVO was hired by gubernatorial candidate Tom Golisano. Its job, get enough signatures to get Golisano on the ballot for the upcoming New York election. We walked house to house looking for individuals, conservative and independent um, individuals who could just help us out to put their representatives on the ballot. Emmanuel says the first month he was paid on time, but Late last month, the checks stopped coming, and he was out hundreds. When we got there, there was, there was a meeting stating that they messed up a lot of checks. A lot of people was furious. They had to call the cops and everything. In all, National Voter Outreach said about 30 workers had similar payment problems. I was just giving a runaround. This worker, who asked that we didn't use his name, says he's owed nearly $1,000. My day would start off calling NVO in my day would end leaving the Department of Labor frustrated at the fact that I, I didn't get any answers. NVO says this campaign worker didn't get paid because he gave an incorrect mailing address, but they gave no reason for Emanuel's late payment. However, just days after we called the Golisano campaign, checks were expressed mailed out to both campaign workers. The lesson for candidate Golisano? To watch the people that he hires and to make sure that everyone that he hires does their job because evidently that, that hasn't been happening. Well, what exactly went wrong? National Voter Outreach said it had a large payroll, more than 700 workers, and they said their supervisors just couldn't keep up with that many employees and they're changing hours. But they're getting it straightened out now. Good, mm -hmm. they'll get their money. Yes, indeed. All right, good That's work. That's what's Kathy. important. Thanks. The prehistoric beasts that kids love to imagine are coming to life in a new exhibit. 
That's ahead on Eyewitness News. Also, state leaders issue a warning about scams that victimize the elderly. And later, the city is making plans to auction off thousands of packs of confiscated cigarettes. They could go for $10 a carton. The Harlem Little League All-Stars are back on home turf, and they were received like champions today. That story coming up. If you have a story for the Eyewitness News investigators, call 1-877-TIP-NEWS. That's 1-877-847-6397. You're watching ABC7, home of Eyewitness News, the news leader. <laughs> A Harlem homecoming fit for a king. The Little Leaguers, who won hearts across the city, have returned. The kids from Harlem returned from Pennsylvania just this afternoon. Mm -hmm. And they were greeted, uh, given a hero's welcome. Kids and grown-ups of all size giving the pint-sized ball players the welcome back that they deserve. Of course, it was for all their hard work in the Little League World Series championship. Art McFarland is in Harlem. I believe, Art, you're on the field where this story began, right? This is indeed where it all began, a field of dreams, you could easily call it. And you know, Sandra, Harlem has a history of honoring its celebrities, but today there were so many themes. There was a theme of athleticism, of sportsmanship, but mostly it was about the children today as the team returned to its home turf and the hometown fans received them with open arms. They were received like conquering heroes without regard to how they placed in their championship run. And some of the Harlem Little Leaguers were overwhelmed by the crowds. How do you feel about all that? I'm excited. I know there's just so many people in my life like this. The celebration for the team's homecoming has the feel of a holiday in Harlem. Their coach says the warm reception began as soon as they hit the city limits on the team bus. We rode down uh, Broadway and we had the banner on the side and it was just unbelievable the reception we got from all the way down Broadway to 125th Street. The team did place third at the Little League World Series, but their achievement was as good as a championship for Harlem as both neighborhood residents and dignitaries agreed. People forget that they are in fact still the state champs and they're the third best team in the United States. I respect baseball more now that they um, worked very hard to get to this point. And the players have the attitude of champions as they listen to all the praise for their achievements. We feel good because our friends are here to support us. And it's good to be home. Well, the team is still scheduled to meet with Mayor Bloomberg. They're supposed to meet with President, former President Clinton. And lots and lots of honors ahead of them. Not even the championship team from Louisville could expect a more rousing reception from the hometown. We're live in Harlem. Art McFarland, ABC7 Eyewitness News. Thanks a lot, Art. It's good to see them back. Since Mayor Bloomberg raised taxes on cigarettes, there has been an underground industry of people smuggling cigarettes into the city to sell them at cheaper prices. Well, now a major haul of illegal cigarettes has been seized. The Department of Consumer Affairs showed off the nearly 12,000 packs of cigarettes seized from 40 stores around the city. This is part of the city's overall campaign uh, to crack down on illegal sales of tobacco with a particular interest in stopping the sale to minors, although today this is unlikely activity. So these cigarettes will be auctioned off to licensed wholesalers. The tobacco companies usually win these auctions. They want to get these cigarettes off the market. The city should raise about $13,000 on the sale. A final push today in Suffolk County to equip police vehicles with a life-saving device, an automated external defibr defibrillator. The machine is used as a first response in cases of cardiac arrest. Today's demonstration was staged to convince Suffolk County legislators to provide the funding needed to put the devices into all police vehicles. The vote is scheduled for tomorrow. Hundreds of thousands of people got a look at a historical project that will change Boston's future. Visitors strolled under the city to tour a huge underground tunnel dubbed the Big Dig. The project will sink two miles of Interstate 93 beneath the city at a cost of more than $14 billion. It's intended to relieve congestion and reconnect Boston's waterfront with its downtown. The northbound tunnel open for the tour is expected to open to traffic in December. New home sales hit a record high last month, jumping 6.7 percent. The Commerce Department says buyers are taking advantage of lower mortgage rates. Sales of previously owned homes are also up. 
Well, shares of Hershey Foods jumped today after a published report of a takeover bid. USA Today reporting that Nestle will offer $11.5 billion for the candy maker. Hershey is based in Pennsylvania, and state leaders are against this deal. They're asking a state judge to issue a restraining order against a possible sale to anyone, saying it would harm the community of Hershey. Good day on Wall Street to tell you about the Dow came back from an early morning slump to finish at uh, 89.19. That's up roughly 46 points. The Nasdaq Composite inched up 11 points and closed at 13.91. A must-see for kids. One exhibit is bringing Ice Age mammals back to life. That's ahead on Eyewitness News. And also state leaders issuing a warning about scams that target seniors. And are you stressed? We've got directions to a spot where you will find a massage for free. That's coming up in the newsreel. Live lottery, easy as ABC. Hey, Ken, the only place to see the New York State Lottery drawing live is right here on ABC7. Watch Wheel Daddy O weeknights for win four numbers, the daily picks, and the numbers game. Catch take five on Eyewitness News at 11 every single night of the week. Take the live lotto drawing on Eyewitness News at 11 every Wednesday and Saturday. Live lottery, as easy as ABC7. Hi, I'm Wayne Brady. Could I have a word with you? How about talk? Oh, talk is a good word to describe my new daytime show. <laughs> Whoa, but it's also entertaining with music oh, and uh, laughs. <laughs> Plus, we'll have celebrities, love your work, and everyday people. OK, that's two words. So come on, hang out at the new Wayne Brady show. And it's going to be, <laughs> well, you know. Catch Wayne Brady starting September 2nd at 10 a.m. right here on ABC7. There's a new campaign underway tonight to try and put the brakes on a growing problem, consumer fraud against senior citizens. More and more often, older people are becoming the victims of unscrupulous business people. Now two city agencies are teaming up in an effort to protect them. I was uh, shocked to learn that they had credit cards all over the country. There this 75-year-old woman was a victim of identity theft, just one of a growing number of crimes specifically targeting senior citizens. It's the number one complaint that we get at the Department for the Aging's hotline are these kind of scams against older people. That's why the city's Departments for the Aging and Consumer Affairs today launched Fraud Against Senior Citizens Awareness Week to educate the public about the issue. For example, telemarketing fraud alone costs consumers an estimated $40 billion a year. More than half of the victims are over 50. The most common fraud scams pulled on the elderly, predatory lending, bogus home improvement deals, identity theft, mail fraud, and telemarketing. Selena Santiago was duped by an unscrupulous contractor. Do you feel like they took advantage of you? Yeah. Yes, I, I, they did. Like Miss Santiago, senior citizens are often victimized at their homes, the crooks going door to door. Other reasons older people are often the victims of such schemes, they tend to be polite and courteous, giving the schemer a way in. Their homeowners thus have plenty to lose, and they often live alone, isolated and easily pressured. Don't let anyone pressure you into making a quick decision, whether it's on a home improvement or some call over the phone or a loan. There is help, but the first important thing is to avoid the problem. Now, the Office of Consumer Affairs says you should always know the companies you do business with. Never give out your credit card information to someone you don't know and get professional help before you sign anything. For more information on senior fraud, you can log on to our website at 7online.com. Time now for a preview of what's ahead on Eyewitness News at 6 o'clock. For that, we turn to Diana Williams in the Eyewitness Newsroom. Diana, great to see you again. Thank you. It's good to be back. And coming up on Eyewitness News at 6 o'clock, a candidate for lieutenant governor reveals personal information about his past, including two children out of wedlock. We'll take a look at what impact that could have on the governor's race. In tonight's extra, schools allowing children to go to school without their required immunizations. We'll take a look at what risk that poses to well, other children. And an long. island known for housing tough prisoners is overrun by cats. We'll take a look at the largest program of its kind to control the feline population. We have those stories and a lot more coming up on Eyewitness News at 6 o'clock, and we hope you'll join us. Now we go back down to the studio. All right. Thank you, Diana. A new U.S. Open tradition that just might rub you the right way. Going back to a moment, frozen in time, and why some people in Brooklyn, well, they have a little egg on their face today.
Here's today's Eyewitness Newsreel. Spectators at the U.S. Open are learning it's not all in the backhand. With all the neck strain from watching the back and forth of competition, massage therapists from Equinox are offering visitors complimentary rubdowns. A nice touch for the more than 600,000 spectators who will attend the Open. Baby, it's cold inside the Smith Haven Mall. That's where there's been a return of the Ice Age. It's an exhibit in the mall's center court of 10 life-sized prehistoric mammals dating back about 70 million years to the Ice Age. And just to add more of an Ice Age feel to the exhibit, there are even periodic snowfalls. Also apparently gone the way of the dinosaur, that diet the borough of Brooklyn announced to offset the famous desserts it's famous for. The first clue? Today's egg cream making extravaganza, a borough-wide competition to find the best in Brooklyn. And it was hardly slim pickings with Brooklyn's diet guru himself, President Marty Markovitz, egging on the competition. Rather, just desserts for this edition of the Eyewitness Newsreel. That's tasty fun out there. Yeah, and then you can get your shoulders rubbed. Mm -hmm. Hip-hugging blue jeans are all the rage, but are denim designers hitting too far below the belt? Coming up, how low should you go? And jeans with a little something extra. Rebecca Rankin gets a ruling from the fashion police. A new high-tech way to treat one of the most common cancers. I'm Dr. Jay Adlersberg. I'll have that story coming up. Tomorrow when I would assume this morning is baseball about to strike out. The countdown to the possible end of the season. That plus your wake up forecast on Eyewitness News this morning at 5. You're watching ABC 7, home of Eyewitness News, the news leader. Ah, uh, yeah, you've seen them on the street, those tight-fitting, hip-hugging, low-riding, eye-catching blue jeans. Well, it seems everyone has a pair, but how low is too low? Rebecca Rankin asking the fashion police, and she joins us with a look at life around here. And it's not, it is not just about how low is too low. There's lots going on. Mm -hmm. Denim has been an American staple for decades and a huge seller for retailers for the past three years. Basically, any jean that you can dream up is available, and there are always new styles coming out. It's been in the designer's jeans for decades, and this year denim comes in every wash, stitch, and leg shape imaginable. Denim is an American classic, and it seems to be getting bigger and bigger as each season is going by. It seems that there's more out there for someone to choose from. Macy says every style, there are embellishments, belts, and whiskering. The hard part might be choosing only one pair. Rise has become a variable in women's jeans for the past few years. This year, Levi's has introduced a reduced rise for men, too, seven and a half inches down from your regular 12. What we've done is we've merged comfort that is required by the male consumer, but also driven sexiness back into jeans wear by developing the low fits. So you've got your regular jeans, your low riders for men and for women, but at Miss 60, they take denim to a whole new level including special order denim scrap dresses. Obviously, recycling is alive and well in some parts of New York. They even have a padded push-up jean to make your booty a little more pronounced. We find it quite sexy to have a very rounded uh, tush, so to speak, and it's seamless. Um, you can't ever tell, nobody would ever know that you have something in there. Now, knowing that women usually want to downplay their backsides, we wanted to get a second opinion. Feels nice? Yeah. He's a little firm. A little firm. I, I, I show something on the butt, you know? Oh, panning on the butt. Nice for skinny people yeah, who have no cool. butt bone. Hey, Ben, look at this. Do you have the money right now? No, I don't. I got enough by myself. Okay. <laughs> and if you've had it with the enhancement, okay. if she gains a little weight, you can take the padding out. Oh, I see. Oh. And there's your bum right there. It's, it's very practical. <laughs> sort of practical. Now, these right here, these would be the low riders for the men. Seven and a half inches of the rise going on there. You guys can check those out. And, uh, you know, they're very, very low, I'm telling you. These ones right here, I know you're waiting to see these babies. I'm dying to see them. Okay, mm -hmm. so these are the Miss 60 ones. These are for right. the women. I took the one pad out of that. one side. There you go. Yeah, I really The other side's all padded up. There you go, well, Sam. No. These are these are 30s for you. <laughs> I, I no, need like um, the 38 what size. What happens uh, if the pad slips? If you've you got like slips and it ends up down you got, like, here. Like, something something down. Yeah. Or what if you have only There's, one in there? Then, you know what? The pads don't I'm migrate just, at all. They, they just stay in one spot because they're mm -hmm. pockets. Totally oh, secure. Check that out. There you go. Good garment. Yes. Pocket padding. Sam doesn't need padding in his jeans, right? But not that we've noticed. Weather.
Well, now that we've gotten just farther than we should have, let's just walk over to the wall. Thank you, Ms. Rector.